Well, greetings and welcome to all. My name is Brian Brannon, and I serve on the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, North America Branch Board of Directors, and its Young Members Group Steering Committee. On behalf of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Young Members Group, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the ADR World Tour, Arbitration and Mediation as a Global Force for Good. The Chartered Institute of Arbitrators presents 11 weekly webinars, which focus on ADR and access to justice, ADR as a means to strengthen the rule of law, and ADR as an efficient alternative to traditional litigation. Today, today, we start with week two after completing a four series tour in Asia last week. We welcome all participants from the Caribbean and especially our local branches, our collaborating partners, the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law and the Korean Commercial Arbitration Board. The ADR World Tour is organized by, by a central group of young practitioners who span the world and today we are uh, joined by two of those young practitioners, uh, Theomenique Theo Norij and Ishan Madan. It's my pleasure to introduce both. Theomenique, uh, her educational background is diverse. She's uh, studied in the United States, the UK, the Bahamas, Costa Rica, and Spain. As a 2005 Greenwich Research Center scholarship recipient, she holds a dual Bachelor of Arts degree with integral honors in international studies in Spanish from Lemoyne College in Syracuse, New York, USA. Theo Monique has also studied Spanish at Centro Panamericano de Idiomas, San Jose, Costa Rica, and the Universidad de Salamanca in Salamanca, Spain. As a result, she has been certified by the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages as having intermediate high proficiency in Spanish. In 2013, Theo Monique obtained a Bachelor of Laws with honors from the University of West Indies, Cave Hill, Barbados. In 2015, she received a legal education certification from the Council of Legal Education's Eugene Dupuc Law School in Nassau, the Bahamas. Theo Monique was subsequently called to the bar of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas in, two, in October of 2015. Theomenique has also competitively been selected for the prestigious Chevening Scholarship by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office of the United Kingdom. And in December of 2016, she was awarded a Master's of Law with Merit in Comparative and International Dispute Resolution from the top ranked school in international arbitration at Queen Mary University of London. Not one to rest on her laurels, in 2017, Theomenique was delighted uh, sorry, de designated as a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and joined the executive committees of the Bahamas branch, Char Bahamas. In 2018, Theo Monique obtained a cert certificate in international arbitration award writing with distinction from the School of International Arbitration at Queen Mary University. Besides her academic accomplishments, Theo Monique has maintained a strong commitment to a professional development as the chair of the Young Arbitrators Committee of Char Bahamas since 2017. In 2019, Theo Monique was elected to a two-year term as co-chair of the Young ICCA, the leading global international arbitration network of over 8,500 members for young practitioners organized under the auspices of the International Council for Commercial Arbitration. In the aforementioned role, roles, Theo Monique has organized and led webinars, initiatives, and projects for the benefit of international arbitration practitioners under 40 years of age, both locally in the Bahamas and internationally. In addition, Theo Monique serves as vice chair of the ADR committee of the Bahamas Bar Association and is a member of the Bahamas Chamber of Commerce and Employers Federation ADR committee, as well as the International Chamber of Commerce Young Arbitrators Forum and the London Court of International Arbitration Young International Arbitration uh, Group. Theo Monique has also published articles on international arbitration and environmental laws. Her articles have appeared in the IUCN Academy of Environmental Law e-journal, e and most recently in the Society of Trust and Estates Practitioners Journal. In August of 2020, Theo Monique joined the minority, I'm sorry, the Ministry of Financial Services, Trade and Industry and Immigration as an arbitration consultant to the government of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas following a successful stint as an associate in the litigation practice of a tier one commercial firm in the Bahamas. 
Welcome, Theo Monique. In addition, it is my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague from the Central Organizing Group of the Young Members Group of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, Ishan Medan. Ishan Medan is the founder of Arbinsal, a platform advancing research, dialogue, and thought leadership on the interplay between international arbitration and insolvency. Ishan is an Indian barred attorney with almost a decade's experience spanning commercial arbitration, civil and corporate litigation, insolvency and restructuring practice. Ishan acquired his master's in international arbitration from Miami Law as its first FDI moot scholar. Ishan has advised and represented several international clients through his practice in India on a plethora of issues and has been certified for admission to the New York State Bar exam, to the New York State Bar. He mixes his practice of law with academia and regu regularly writes and lectures on international arbitration. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Ishan and Theo Monique, the co-moderators of the Caribbean branch leg of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Young Members Group ADR World Tour. Please enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian, for that detailed introduction and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, Good afternoon to all our friends here in the East Coast and the Caribbean, and uh, good evening to our friends in Asia and elsewhere in the world. Uh, we hope that you're all well and that the news of vaccination is bringing hope in your respective communities. As things get better in terms of the pandemic, we are likely to see an uptick in disputes, and here we are to discuss ADR as a global force for good. Now, before we move on to our awesome panelists, I would just quickly first like to in, uh, begin with some housekeeping suggestions. Uh, all the attendees are requested uh, to please share their questions in the chat box and uh, do drop in a hello mentioning where you're from. Uh, questions will be taken up towards the end of the discussion. And during the event, you may also see some poll questions popping up on your Zoom screen. So the purpose of these poll questions is basically as part of the world tour. We are collecting views from the attendees in every region, in every continent, in every event that we're conducting about the prevalent ADR practices, and we're going to prepare and publish a comparative report by the end of the world tour, and we request you to please help us with that. And must I also point out as a disclaimer that the views shared by the speakers, the panelists today may not necessarily reflect the views of any organizations, entity or firm that they may be associated with or affiliated with or represent. The views uh, may also only be academic for the purpose of discussion. Anything discussed here shall not be attributable to any related organizations unless the speakers or panelists desire and indicate so. Now, thank you so much for bearing with the mandatory announcements. Uh, and also the poll questions that come up on your screen, you, you can answer them with full anonymity. Now, without further ado, I invite my colleague, Theomenik, to please introduce our esteemed people on screen and to begin with the session. Theo, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Ishan, and also thank you, Brian, for introducing us. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christopher Malcolm. He is a former attorney general of the British Virgin Islands, a director of the Mona Law Institute's unit, deputy dean for external affairs and senior lecturer of the faculty of law at Mona University of the West Indies. He's also executive director of the Street Law Caribbean. He's a secretary general of the Mona International Center for Arbitration and Mediation a member of Caribbean ADR Chambers, a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. He's a chair of the Caribbean branch of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. And he's also a member of the technical advisory group, Improved Access to Justice in the Caribbean, the IMPACT project, which is concerned with arbitration and alternative dispute resolution. He has published several peer reviewed and other journal articles and he has also represented both public and private sector persons or entities and generally, as well as more specifically in relation to arbitration and ADR. Thanks so much, Dr. Malcolm, for joining us today. Thank you, Thea Monique, and thank you, Ishan and Brian, for having invited me and to the audience listening. I hope to be able to add in a productive way to this session that we're having. Just by way of clarification and disclaimer. I am not the deputy dean of the faculty that I was. And in fact, I am no longer the chair. I was the chair of the Caribbean branch. And what was then when it was established, the Mona 
my come as it was is in fact the Jamaica International Arbitration Center. So just by way of clarification, I want to, for the record, make that clear. But having said that, substantively, we're where we are. We have an exciting program and I have been asked to look at some of the developments that have been happening across the region in the area of ADR and where we are now and possibly where we could be getting. Now, when I, in the few minutes I have, I think it is important for me to emphasize that we in the Commonwealth Caribbean, meaning the Caribbean region where we have a link to the UK, sometimes are a little arrogant in how we see ourselves that we do not adequately recognize that the Caribbean is a vast expanse, including French speaking territories, English speaking, of course, Spanish speaking, Dutch speaking, and uh, there are places that run along the rim as well of South and Central America and North America as well, that are often considered to be part of our Caribbean basin. And for those who may not know, for example, if you were just to take a trip out to Rotan, which is part of out there, out, out there in Honduras and that side, people there speak English because they were pirates effectively. It was a pirate station for those persons who were in Port Royal. And of course, you go out into parts of Colombia and so on, there are islands out there where people still speak English. And of course, if you go into Panama City, the canal was built primarily with, assist, with persons from Barbados and Jamaica. And of course, you have a lot of things happening in those regions. And of course, there's always the gem Haiti, without whom I like to say we ourselves in the region may not have known the freedom we now know. It was their own revolution that led to a lot of what happened elsewhere in the region. And we are eternally grateful for the levels of support we have had through our brothers and sisters across the region. It is something that we need to remember when we're thinking of how we develop and not to limit ourselves to the Anglo Ang Ang English speaking region, which is limited in number one and also limited in scope in terms of where we can develop and where we need to go. Now, having said that, I must also give the disclaimer that when I speak, I'm able to speak in the context more particularly of the Commonwealth Caribbean, because I can't, cannot claim to have any expansive knowledge of what else is happening in the other parts of the region. And for that reason, I'm particularly happy to see my good friend Rose online, who can also speak to some of the developments, for example, in Haiti and its long history of involvement in the area of arbitration and the fact that she can give that French related side of who we are and what we do as a region. But back to where we are, the region has in the last, over the last many years, been working in a very steady way to build out in the field of ADR and how we develop. But again, even in that, I like to remind people as I have written in the, perhaps the very first paragraph of my contribution to the, to, to the World Arbitration Report or report on Jamaica, that in the context of Jamaica, our attachment to and our involvement in dispute management has a long history, including through our native Maroon community, because they have their own communal ways of resolving disputes that have always been and remain community centered. And it is essentially mediation driven and driven in a way where like happens in parts of Southern Africa in this concept of Ubuntu, everything comes back to the community. So disputes are resolved never for the benefit of the individuals primarily, but for the benefit of the community. And that is a model which we are always seeking to build upon knowing that we have native history and we're not reliant on people from anywhere else to tell us of that native history because we have it and we have built up on it. And the same could be said of other parts of the region, but in a much more modernistic way as to what is happening, what we have seen over the last several years is, an, is, a, is a movement towards improvement in an enhancement of the, what we call the legal, the formal legal infrastructure for the development of ADR across our region. So we have seen, for example, new arbitration laws being implemented in Bahamas, in the BVI, in Jamaica and elsewhere. And much of that modeling that has been developing and the move has been a move driven by the UNCITRAL model law, 
and the rules coming out of that. And in the case of Jamaica, for example, which I'm most familiar with, we ourselves had a law which came about in effectively 2017 is when it was formally implemented. And again, I'm happy to see my colleague John Rooney on, on screen because John was the UNCITRAL consultant who worked with us in getting that particular law implemented here in Jamaica. And similar laws, of course, there's a model that has been developed through the, the Impact Justice Project, which is pretty much modeled on UNCITRAL as well. I was my part, myself part of that technical committee that's helped to develop that. And that has been adopted by CARICOM and is being made available to the rest of the region for development. The other significant move that we need to look at in an infrastructure level is the movement that has been happening in the field of mediation. And a lot of this was driven, if, to be fair, to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, to the DRF, the, the, the Dispute Resolution Foundation of Jamaica, which about a quarter of a century or so ago, started to push the, 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 the initiative for court-connected mediation across the region. And much of what has happened elsewhere in the region in Trinidad and so on, really became modeled on what was happening with the DRF. And their model has really spread significantly across the region and a lot of activity has been happening in that. Most recently, we have of course seen at a global level, the implement, well, the, the, the signing into force of the, of, of the Singapore Convention on Mediation. And I'm happy to say that both Jamaica and, 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 and Haiti, Rose is on, were parties, first day signatory parties to that convention. I was myself there in, in Singapore for the signing. Rose was also very instrumental in getting Haiti signed on to that. And we, of course, are seeking to move across the region again with this level of new harmonization, which should have significant impact on how we move. In addition to these infrastructural developments that have been happening, we have also seen a development of institutions across the region. And we have, which is actually a very good thing, that you have had individual jurisdictions moving towards establishing themselves as credible jurisdictions for dispute management in the broadest sense. Arbitration has been, to date, a sexy topic and a point of departure. But with the pandemic and how it has come on, we are now seeing even greater move towards mediation and facilitated negotiation, which in my own view are the areas that are likely to develop with even greater force going forward because of their recognition that where you have parties, all of whom are suffering, then the way to go is not really to, to engage in a fight, but to engage in meaningful dialogue that can result in resolutions that can be for the benefit of all parties. And those are the things that I'm excited about as we seek to develop, excited as well, that there is a young members group, part of which I am now and others, who are pushing this idea of seeing how we can move across jurisdictions and within jurisdictions to find effective ways to develop and to support the best interests of our people. And I say this again in another context, a decade or so ago, or even earlier, the move was really to determine best practice by reference to Europe and what was happening there. The current position is not Europe. The current position is to follow what is happening in Asia. And even the Europeans are sending their de delegations into Asia to follow what is happening there and why it is that ADR is developing at the role and at the pace that it has been developing and to the great value of the people that it has been having. And in that context, what it says to me is that the whole area and avenue for insularity really does not exist. We operate in a space where we must find ways to collaborate as we are doing now. And we must find ways to encourage and support others as hopefully we all will be doing and not to throw cold water on initiatives. It is true that people will say, well, there are a multiplicity of initiatives and there is a possibility that they will effectively implode upon each other. But the truth is you should all allow the flowers to bloom and those which have the longest lasting scent are the ones that we will attach to best. And it is an arena where we really need to allow persons to develop their initiatives, encourage them the best we can and give them the sorts of support that we are able so they can move forward. 
Now, what is the value of arbitration in the region, how we're going to, and, and ADR generally, and how we're going to move with it? Of course, in our context, it is not simply about dispute settlement for the sake of dispute settlement. I think in the case of our region, we have seen the dispute settlement arena as one which could have significant implications for our continuing desire for sustainable economic development. Not just in the sense that these are likely to themselves cause business activity to thrive, but because they are themselves their own business activities. And the question is, how do we ensure that we put sustainability policies and practices in place? And how do we get the best possible options that are available? In doing this, we have a lot of internal resources on which we can rely both internal to particular jurisdictions as well as internal to the region. But we also recognize that best practice will require us to have our tentacles way beyond our region. In my own particular case, I have been stretching my tentacles in a very real way to Asia. And I have very strong connections in Asia as much as I do elsewhere. But Asia and parts of Africa, I have even stronger connections than I do in Asia because I see those as places which are much closer to us in terms of who we are, in terms of our historical development, and in terms of what it is that we are required to do. And I think as we go forward, the lesson to be learned, if any, is that as we move, we are not to be stuck in a mode of what has been, but to recognize that we are in an emerging field where new and creative ideas will take us forward. The pandemic has caused us havoc in many ways, but it has also brought about many real opportunities. And the greatest opportunity in it, as I see it, is the opportunity for leveling. I think we are for the very first time in my own practice at a stage where a practitioner in London is not necessarily any more advantaged than one in the Bahamas, except by reference to your capacity for innovation and your capacity for creative use of your own intellect. And those are the levelers that we have found. And that for me is what is most exciting at this time. And I think if we find creative ways to work together, we can expand the field to the eternal good of our peoples and to the eternal good of the societies we serve. I know my time is limited. I could speak forever, but I will stop at this stage and answer whatever questions you may have for me afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Malcolm. Uh, and very important thing that you said, it's, it's the pandemic has been a leveler and perhaps an opportunity to create a lot of new things and to catch up on a lot of things that should have been done. Uh, now, before uh, we move on, I would like to just uh, initiate one of the poll questions and, you know, uh, attendees, please feel free to answer them. These answers will be anonymous and we're just going to simultaneously proceed uh, with the panel discussion. You may see the question on your uh, screen and you may please continue answering it. Now, moving on, uh, I invite our next speaker, uh, one of my favorites, Ms. Rose Ramo. Uh, Rose Ramo is a partner at uh, Ramo International Law in Washington, DC. A native of Haiti, she is a leading practitioner and former Fulbright scholar and visiting professor in the field of international arbitration. She was recently appointed by Haiti at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague amongst many of her other laurels and achievements. She's also an ICC court member on behalf of Haiti. She's licensed to practice law in Paris, Republic of Ghana, uh, in the USA and District of Columbia, New Jersey and Florida. Ms. Ramo is trained in both civil and common law. And as an international arbitration and practitioner, she represents host states and investors in investment, in investment disputes and has been appointed sole arbitrator in commercial disputes involving Africans and foreign nationals. So clearly uh, from the Caribbean, but then all over the world and truly an international ADR practitioner. Uh, Rose, uh, welcome. And I'll just follow on from uh, what Dr. Malcolm said about leveling. Uh, we really want to hear from you about the Caribbean landscape in the international ADR framework, the challenges, the successes, the question marks, and also what you see as the future for ADR in Caribbean. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Ishan, for inviting me. Brian, Theo, thank you. Uh, and everyone involved in organizing this uh, webinar. Well, Dr. Malcolm said something very interesting about engaging Haiti. 
my experience has been because Haiti is a French speaking country, oftentimes Haiti is left out from the conversation. And that's why, especially, I am so grateful to be here because most of the time when we're talking about the Caribbean, um, it's the Commonwealth country, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, and St. Vincent. So you, 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 you barely see Haitians on the table. So it's, it's truly an honor. And, um, and I'm happy to um, report that Haiti actually has the oldest arbitration system in the Caribbean. Um, what's important to note is that because of the political instability in Haiti, um, that has prevented Haiti from moving forward. But to say, before I go forward, I have to say one thing. There is an African proverb that says, when your neighbor's house is on fire, don't be in the slumber, get up and help your neighbor turn out the fire. Because if you sleep, sooner or later, the fire will get to your door. I say this because um, I find that there's been so much discrimination towards Haitians and Haiti in itself. Um, even to be here on this webinar could pose some problem for some people because they don't see Haiti as being part of the Caribbean, which is absolutely absurd. Haiti has been there from uh, help from emancipation since 1804, helping its neighbors um, gaining the independence. Haitians have come to the United States. Um, fought in the American Revolution. Haiti has been at the forefront of many things. And, um, and it's very important to engage Haiti in the conversation, even if the systems in Haiti are old. And the reason I would say, and I don't speak for the government of Haiti, what I've noticed is that once we have one government, if that government is not interested in commerce or in different issues, they are not likely to go and um, enact certain laws that would um, help commerce in Haiti. As a result, you'll have a government going for five years and nothing is done. And then when the next one comes, maybe you'll get a chance, something will be done. And you see that through, for instance, the ICSID convention, which was uh, signed, <laughs> but since in the 1980s, and it did not even get ratified until um, I believe 2000, 2009. So that's the problem with having Haiti being up to date. Now, what are the challenges? What I see as challenges is, is the fragmentation of the national laws. Um, some countries in the Caribbean are doing great, others are not so great. And um, you also have the fragmentation of the language and um, all that caused us to actually slow down, slowing the process of our development. But I think with the proper discourse, like I've been engaged with Dr. Malcolm and other people in the Caribbean, those who are friendly, who wants to invite Haitians to the table, I'm more than willing to work with them and to move forward for bigger and greater things. One example I have, I have to uh, t tell you a little bit about the, how old the Haitian system is. Arbitration is actually in the book four of the civil code, article 955. It clearly says the parties are free to choose a private procedures such as arbitration, that's it. And then you have article 925 of the code civil in Haiti that says when you do sign an agreement, you must abide by it. That sounds pretty easy, but you always find people who would not hold on to the agreement. And then Article 10 says, you cannot sign a private contract if it concerns um, a breach of moral good and public order. So in Haiti, you have different type of arbitration. You have the commercial arbitration, ad hoc arbitration, and you have institutional arbitration. And by institutional, I'm talking about the oldest institution in the Caribbean. That's uh, the CCAH, which is um, um, the Chambre um, 
conciliation d'arbitrage d'Haïti. It's the Haitian conciliation arbitration um, chambers um, in Haiti. It was created in 1935, but it did not um, come into um, come into uh, uh, play until the 2009 when when actually the um, board of directors of the CCAH, when they actually sign in the statutes to make it workable, a workable instrument. So the CCAH is the body that um, the, the Haitian government actually say, well, with that body, we can have international arbitration. And then you have also where Haiti signed the Exit Convention 30th June 1985, ratified it in 2009. And there again, I explain is this, you know, uh, long space you see between from a signing to ratification. Currently, as Dr. Malcolm mentioned, I was very instrumental in helping Haiti signing the Singapore Convention 2019. So when is it gonna be ratified? I don't know. I don't work for the Haitian government. I can continue the dialogue and then hopefully um, I'll find uh, a, a, a minister who can push it and get it ratified. But just to get the agreement going, it's always pulling teeth because Haiti, this political situation is quite unstable. Now, when you compare that, that's why I'm saying some are doing very great, others not as great. You compare that to the Dominican Republic, for instance. Arbitration legislation uh, uh, in Dominican Republic has been based on unstitutional model law. Um, they are also a party of the New York Convention. Um, and by the way, Haiti is also a party of the New York Convention. And um, they have laws on commercial arbitration applicable to arbitration agreements, proceedings and enforcement of commercial arbitration awards. The Dominican Republic Central America Free Trade Agreement also called for arbitration as a preferred dispute resolution mechanism. And you have many other, about 15 bilateral investment treaties between Dominican Republic and some uh, and its uh, counterpart, Brazil. And, and Haiti is one of them. And that's one of the things I think that's great uh, about Haitian, Haiti and Dominican Republic. As many of you may know, it's, it's just one island. Um, one part is French, one part is Sp Spanish, and um, they have not gotten along well in, in a number of years. And one of the things that I'm engaged in and committed to do is trying to help Haiti and Dominican Republic resolving the, the differences. They share a border, a physical border, and, um, and, and we must deal with, with uh, Dominican Republic. And, and by being a member of the, of the New York Convention will allow uh, Dominicans when they have contract with Haitians, uh, if there is um, an award, it's, it, it could be enforced. But the way enforcement is done in Dominican Republic is different the way it's done in Haiti, mainly because of the uh, Haiti is still uh, using the old system. Dominican Republic seems to be more um, advanced in, in keeping up um, by uh, enacting laws that mirror unstitutional model law and also um, doing other, for instance, Dominican Republic has the uh, national committee for ICC. Um, I'm still working on one from Haiti. <laughs> Hopefully that will happen. Now, Shen you, you, Shen, you mentioned what are the successes? So the success that I'm, um, I'm, I'm happy to report is that uh, Haiti and Dominican Republic have recognized the need to resolve the disputes. And as such, the CCAH, which is the Chambre de Conciliation d'Arbitrage d'Haïti and CRC, which is the Chambers of Commerce in, in uh, Dominican Republic, they have teamed up to have something that we call binational conferences. This is um, um, well supported by uh, many organizations. In these binational conferences, um, each jurisdiction will attempt to um, present on the rule of law and steps in their own jurisdiction. Basically, we will be teaching, it's like uh, capacity building, teaching one another. This is how it works in Dominican Republic. This is how it works in Haiti. 
So we are also, with, with that, we are hoping to build trust, create momentum so that Haitians and Dominicans can, can, can share this beautiful island and do commerce together and, 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 and actually um, um, avoid going to court and hopefully uh, lead to arbitration, mediation, conciliation, negotiation, however they choose to, in order to promote better commerce between those two countries. And hopefully um, we will see that among other countries, but Haiti and Dominican Republic is very special. The very first binational um, conference is happening in two days, January 28, 2021. And it's going to be hybrid and virtual. It was supposed to be in Haiti. And um, you know, as the pandemic, we had to uh, we think always, like Dr. Malcolm said, now uh, the, 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 everything is shifted, maybe for our own good. So um, all of you, I, I would like to invite you to, and I will uh, share the information on um, social media. Um, the other great success um, um, we have to think about, think about this, um, the border that Haiti shares with Dominican Republic, uh, there's been allegations that perhaps Haiti, uh, Dominican Republic border may, may be encroaching on Haiti. So you see, there, there is possibly a, a, a possible border dispute that is greater than we could think of. And we are hoping that it's, it won't get to the level to go to the PCA, the ICJ, and, and we are hoping that we can, we can uh, resolve it among ourselves. Now the future is The future is mediation. Why is mediation the future? We know that international arbitration has gotten a lot of heat in the in the uh, past ten years with uh, heavy awards in de for developing states in Africa, in uh, different uh, uh, countries in Latin America. You know the uh, Argentina cases. Um, and so forth and so on. And I think that the states are disenchanted to see those big awards and they are trying to see in what way can we come together and resolve it. And mediation now, international mediation especially, is becoming very important with the Singapore Convention. And also we're gonna see a, a more capacity building. There will be advisory board, there will be different ways to help states um, um, get to negotiation, mediation, before running before a tribunal and still get hit with a big award. And I think that's it for me. Unless you have uh, any other questions, I would like to stop here. Thank you. I believe my colleague Theomini does have some questions, but perhaps I think it, it's better uh, to leave those questions at the end so that we can have a nice round robin. Uh, but thank you so much, Rose. That was very informative and perhaps information that everybody should know firsthand. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I will announce now the next poll question and uh, we'll invite Theomini to take over from there, too. Thanks, Ishan. And also thank you, Rose, for that very insightful presentation. While the poll question is going on, I wanted to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor John Rooney. He is an international arbitrator and practicing attorney and adjunct professor at the University of Miami Law School where he teaches international commercial arbitration and international business transactions. With both civil law and common law education, Professor Rooney is barred in Louisiana, Texas, and Florida. His practice focuses on international commercial matters. His practice and experience as an arbitrator encompasses both institutional and ad hoc arbitrations in the US, the Caribbean, Latin America, Europe, and ICSID. He is also the vice chair of the Miami International Arbitration Society and has been for over a decade coaching Miami law students participating in various international arbitration MOOC competitions, including the Willem C. Vies MOOT. He speaks Spanish and Portuguese and teaches the International Commercial Arbitration Seminar and the International Business Transactions courses at the University of Miami School of Law. Professor Rooney, thank you for taking the time today to join us and we're looking forward to your presentation on the arbitrating and mediating in the Caribbean as a practitioner and academic. Um, so thank you whenever you are ready to begin. 
Monique, thank you. Thank you so much for the kind words of introduction. Um, before I start, there were a couple of acknowledgements I wanted to make. First, of course, to the organizers of the event, um, both institutionally and individually, and for reaching out and asking me to participate, of which I consider to be a great honor. Um, second, I, I just wanted to make a reference to our principal sponsor, which is the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Many years ago, a friend of mine who was involved in the institution encouraged me to um, sit for the examination to become a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. So I went through the program, I did the workshops, et cetera. And I just wanted to say that in terms of what I do as an arbitrator, it was one of the most useful things that I've ever done. It's rare that one has an opportunity to sit down in a forum in which the only other people there are arbitrators, right? So you can sit and you can talk about the problems that arbitrators have and how you deal with recalcitrant parties, how you deal with issues involving production of documents, et cetera. So I just wanted to mention that for those of you who are not members and might be considering to do so, for me, it was in fact a very, very, very useful thing. The other thing I wanted to mention also highlight was uh, the reference that Theo Monique made to the fact that I'm from Louisiana. Louisiana, as you probably know, is the only jurisdiction in the United States of the 50 states. And, and, and there I'm, if I include Puerto Rico, it was Puerto Rico, of course, and Louisiana, that are uh, in terms of their system of private law, have a system of uh, Roman or civil law, as opposed to common law. Although Louisiana is probably a bit closer to being a mixed jurisdiction perhaps than, 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 than Puerto Rico. That has turned out to be for me personally, uh, actually a tremendous and inadvertent advantage um, because one of the constant um, themes that appear in the arbitrations that I deal with, not in all, but in many, is um, the fact that you have parties from different legal traditions and you have different ways of looking at and interpreting contracts. Um, the other thing would be that when the international business transactions class I teach at Miami, I had to make up my own material because the first year the university ordered the wrong book. So what I did is I decided that I would take, I would teach the class through the portal of rules of interpretation of contracts, comparing the common law and the civil law. And the other thing that I found is that that also became one of the repetitive themes in many of the arbitrations that I've dealt with. And then the third acknowledgement that I wanted to make was to UNCTRAL, which will be more of an introduction to what I'm gonna be talking about. The United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, as was referenced by Professor Malcolm and was referenced by Rose as well, um, has developed a model law of international commercial arbitration. The law suffered one amendment by UNCTRAL, and, but presently there are 88 jurisdictions around the world in which the uh, UNCTRAL model law has been adopted to such an extent that UNCTRAL feels comfortable effectively recognizing the jurisdiction as an UNCTRAL jurisdiction. Um, looking at the list of status that we find in the UNCTRAL website with respect to, and also I, I would like to make, make another clarification, and that is I think Professor Malcolm's observation to what I would consider to be the greater Caribbean, or if I could say so, what I would call maybe the, the, the insular Caribbean in, in, in the sense that many of the, of the, of the jurisdictions are located or, or share islands. So we, we have a smaller nucleus of jurisdictions with the insular curriculum uh, 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 Caribbean than we do with respect to what we call the greater Caribbean. If we look to the greater Caribbean, as was noted, we touch on the United States, we touch on all of the um, states, uh, the countries of uh, Central America, Mexico, Northern uh, South America, that also touch on either the Gulf of Mexico or the Caribbean Sea. First, I wanna concentrate a little bit on what I would consider to be the insular Caribbean. As Professor Malcolm mentioned, um, Jamaica, is, uh, has adopted the model law uh, to such an extent that it is classified as a model law jurisdiction. Uh, Barbados has done so as well. Um, BVI has done so, Bermuda. I'm not sure if Bermuda would really be considered to be the, um, the Caribbean, um, but it, it has also adopted the model law. 
If we look at the greater Caribbean, what we see is that the list expands to Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, Nicaragua, uh, Venezuela. Um, both uh, Colombia and Panama have new arbitration laws, but although they were influenced by the model law, they have not been classified by the uh, by UNCTRAL as model law jurisdictions. Both of the laws, I think, are good. I, I think is in particular that I would say the Panamanian law has probably made what I would consider to be advances and improvements on some aspects of, of the model law. But the fact is that there has been a penetration in the region um, of texts that are supported by UNCTRAL. So why is it a good thing that a jurisdiction adopt the model law or certainly take it into account when considering legislation? And I know also that the Bahamas also has new arbitration legislation as well. When I say new, I mean something that is what I would consider to be modern arbitration legislation. It doesn't exactly follow the model law. It borrows, I think, parts of the model law. I think it's influenced also by what we consider to be the Westminster law, uh, model, which would be the, um, the, the English Arbitration Act, I, I think, of, what is it, 1996, 97, I think. Um, and, um, and, and also what we see in the Caribbean is those countries that are not, um, those English speaking countries that have not adopted the model law tend in many times to have um, as their arbitration law, old versions of English arbitration law. None of them that I'm aware of have adopted the new English Arbitration Act. Uh, as I said, other than the influence I think that it had on the Bahamian law. Um, but we go to some jurisdictions and we go back, I believe if my memory is correct, if we look at, um, if we look at Trinidad, I think we're looking at um, the 1900 version of the English Arbitration Act. So I think for the region in terms of the promotion of arbitration, that the acceptance of the model law by some countries and its consideration by others, I think in my opinion anyway, is I think a, a, very, a very good and, 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 and positive thing. Um, as far as the New York Convention, the penetration is, is, is of course much greater. There are 166 countries that are presently contracting states of the New York Convention. Um, one had to look for a, for a jurisdiction that was not. And of course, I did have to uh, work on a team that uh, enforced uh, an award in um, BVI uh, at a time when in fact BVI was not one of those jurisdictions, but now it is, right? Um, and, and BVI also, as I said, has also adopted the model law as well, so as to be considered to be uh, and UNCTRAL model law on, on, on the webpage. Um, the characteristics of the model law are, are such that one of the things that I do, and let me just take a little aside, when I teach the class, uh, I obviously look at our US law and then there's all of the other laws out there, right? You can't, if you, if you spent the rest of the time on all the other laws, you would never get past the letter C, right? So we use the UNCTRAL model law as kind of, um, a, a, a surrogate for all other arbitration laws. But the other reason to do so is because when you're aware of the content of the model law, you have, a, you have a ruler or a benchmark against which you can judge and measure the arbitration laws of the various jurisdictions in which one might uh, find either a potential arbitration as the seat or a jurisdiction whose law would supply the law that would, um, that would um, be applicable to the arbitration agreement. With respect to my participation in, in, in this event, right, um, I have been blessed in terms of having experience in arbitrations, either as arbitrator or uh, as a member of a legal team um, in BVI, uh, in Haiti, in the Dominican Republic, in Puerto Rico, um, in other jurisdictions in the region as well. And as Professor Malcolm referenced, I was really honored to be picked as one of the consultants to travel to Kingston back in 2011, um, when Jamaica really sat down and seriously started thinking about the, um, the, the model law. One of the things that I've noticed in terms of arbitration in the, in the region, that was my 10 minute warning, I'll be brief and I will conclude in just a moment, um, is, and I think it's true of anyone who practices in the area, 
we have a general notion, but we really don't understand the details of difference until we're actually involved in a dispute. So to sit as counsel, for example, in BBI, um, with, for example, an arbitrator who is a retired English judge, it would be very different than sitting in an arbitration in New York with a panel of three, for example, uh, partners of New York law firms, even if the law was applicable was the same. You notice this in terms of decorum, you notice it in terms of deference, you notice it in terms of the way that you would have to comport yourself, right? I think sometimes involvement in the BVI case, some of my teammates would probably like to pull on my, my sleeve and say, calm down a little bit, because we, we, I think, tend sometimes to be a little more direct and, and, and not so aggressive, really, because I think it's very different, obviously, to litigate an arbitration than it is to do so in, in, a, in a court. Um, but, but there are different styles, there are different ways of looking at things. Um, and I see those differences not only obviously with respect to the region as a whole, but also within the region as well. So one of the things that I learned a long time ago is to try to leave preconceptions uh, at the door, right? And let the situation as I develop, as I see it, uh, and as it develops, direct how I'm going to participate in it. And um, with that, and as to close, I will also say that my first contact really with arbitration in the Caribbean was back in 2011 when I went to Kingston as an Unstral consultant. And um, I was incredibly impressed at the wealth and talent of the human resource in the area of arbitration. And I will say this, that it is a, it is a resource that is underutilized and that, that many do not Many other jurisdictions don't even realize that it's there. One of the things we're doing at the Miami International Arbitration Society is to reach out to our neighbors, right? And to become, get them more involved. And one of our initiatives is to look at the Caribbean and to be inclusive and to bring into our group um, those in the Caribbean who practice arbitration as well. I can also go on forever. I won't, I'll stop now. <laughs> Thank you very much again for the time and the opportunity to talk to you. Well, well thank you so much, Professor Rooney. Um, now I'll quickly launch another poll, which you may all answer. And while you, uh, the audience answers that, I would like to invite our next speaker uh, who, who practices in the BBI. And uh, there's so much that I personally also have to learn from what she's going to share. So Paula, Gibbs. Paula Gibbs is a senior associate at Harlings in the British Virgin Islands. She's a dispute resolution lawyer with experience in London, Singapore, Hong Kong, the BVI, Australia, and New Zealand. She's admitted in England and Wales, New Zealand, and the BVI. Paula advises on complex commercial disputes, including shareholder disputes, international fraud and asset tracing, cross-border insolvency, and again, enforcement. She frequently works on urgent injunctions, applications, including freezing injunctions and disclosure orders in support of foreign court proceedings. Paula has advised on ad hoc and institutional arbitrations under the ICC, LTIA, CAC, HKIAC, ICSID, and UNCITRAL rules. Welcome, Paula. Uh, and I now invite you to please talk about the practical considerations, you know, working in an offshore jurisdiction at an offshore firm that specializes in bankruptcy and insolvency and in, in asset tracing and everything that we just discussed. Please talk about the practical considerations that one might have uh, for enforcement in an offshore jurisdiction in the BVI in Cayman. And uh, then perhaps you can follow that up with uh, what one must look at for injunctive relief for uh, uh, to manage offshore accounts and any other unseen issues that you would like to talk about. The floor is yours, welcome. Thank you very much, Ishan and uh, Brian, um, for inviting me to speak. I'm, I'm honored to be on this esteemed panel and to have the opportunity. And um, uh, I've really enjoyed the speakers so far. And thank, thank you also, Theo Monique, um, for, for participating. Um, I, for, firstly, before addressing uh, the points that Ishan has asked me um, to speak about, I would just like to and reiterate what Dr. Malcolm have said, has said and, and say that I hope 
that you know one of the silver linings of the pandemic has been this re-leveling and that that will create more opportunities um, for arbitration in uh, the Caribbean and that, that that parties will now think about uh, seating their arbitration in, in the jurisdictions in the Caribbean where there's a wealth of ta talent, particularly if there's a Caribbean counterparty or if ultimately the award will need to be enforced in the Caribbean and move away from the traditional locations, London, Paris, Hong Kong, which, you know, where we know the institutions are all extremely busy. Um, and in the Caribbean, we have very capable institutions that maybe don't have the same a huge caseload that will be able to move nimbly and assist parties um, with arbitration in jurisdictions where they may ultimately need to enforce. Um, so I, I will speak about um, enforcement um, and interim relief uh, and also considerations of asset tracing um, with a particular focus on the BVI um, and some reference to Cayman. And, um, one of the tr trends that we have seen over the last few years in the BVI, and I think it's been noted in the Queen Mary White and Case survey, that um, while traditionally arbitration awards were voluntarily complied with, there's an increasing trend um, towards uh, parties not complying with awards. And so um, we are seeing more applications for enforcement um, in the BVI. Um, as Professor Rooney said, the BVI is model law jurisdiction and um, the enforcement process, it has also acceded to the New York Convention um, by extraterritorial application by the United Kingdom. So the enforcement process is fairly straightforward and there are you know, few opportunities um, to refuse uh, registration or to challenge the award. Uh, the BVI is a pro-arbitration jurisdiction and uh, the courts are very supportive of arbitration. Um, I'd also like to note on the uh, implications of the pandemic that the BVI commercial court very quickly moved on to holding Zoom hearings. I think I had a hearing uh, in mid-March uh, last year. And so, you know, that also shows the capabilities of the courts um, in the Caribbean to respond and move quickly um, and to respond to parties' needs. Um, so from the point of view of enforcement, we've certainly seen um, a growth in uh, in uh, enforcement of awards in the BVI and um, uh, including against states and um, applications to uh, resist enforcement. And so um, for this reason, I think it's very important that parties start to think about enforcement earlier on in the process. Um, and, you know, Ideally, from the time of contracting, a lot of the disputes that we see in the BVI are shareholder disputes or joint venture disputes. So ideally, at the time of contracting, you might have some awareness of where assets are ultimately located if it all goes wrong. But if not, certainly at the outset of the arbitration, um, it, you know, if, if you know strategically it's going to be an acrimonious dispute, it's worth giving some thought to ultimately where the assets are located. Um, and... Uh, you know, as I said, the enforcement process is quite straightforward in the BVI and in Cayman if the assets are located there. But as Ishan alluded to, um, if the respondent is not a BVI or a Cayman Islands company, um, uh, then you might need to do some prior work to uh, locate, to have some evidence that assets are located in the BVI or the Cayman Islands before being able to enforce the award in those jurisdictions. And so there are a number of methods um, by which you can obtain that information um, and uh, uh, you, know, you can do searches. There are asset tracing firms that, that specialize in doing those particular searches. Um, sometimes there'll be publicly available information such that you'll know um, that a BVI company owns assets in a publicly listed company and through uh, disclosures required by that publicly listed company of ultimate beneficial owners, um, you'll be able to obtain information that valuable assets are held by a BVI company that are ultimately held by an individual who might be a respondent to an award. So uh, there are uh, methods to obtain that information. Um, if, if your information is not that concrete, uh, then there's also the possibility of making an large pharmacal application. Um, uh, if you suspect that assets have been transferred to a BVI company, for example, 
to prevent enforcement of an, an award. Um, and, and so that's an application that we frequently make in the British Virgin Islands and in the Cayman Islands. It's, it's a disclosure order um, and you can obtain that against the registered agent of the company. The registered agent will have all the book, books and records of the company, information about who the, the shareholders are and um, the test uh, for whether um, that information needs to be provided you will you'll have to prove uh, some that the that the that the company the registered agent has been innocently mixed up in the wrongdoing by the company so whether that's evasion of the arbitration award or you know potentially some other allegations um if if there was fraud for example um so uh, the third topic then to consider um and uh if you have a a foreign seated arbitration. This is also something worth considering if you know the assets are ultimately in the BVR, the Cayman Islands, is um, freezing uh, in injunctive relief uh, in support of the arbitration. And under the uh, BVI Arbitration Act, the courts have wide powers to grant interim relief. It's not necessarily necessary to make an application to the tribunal um, first, so the, the application could be made before the tribunal is constituted. Um, even if the tribunal is constituted, it's not necessary uh, to make the application to the tribunal first if you felt there was an urgent risk that the assets were going to be dissipated. But that may also depend on the wording of the particular arbitration rules. Um, so that's also something that's worth considering uh, when choosing the rules of arbitration um, and particularly if you're ultimately going to need to enforce in the BVI because um, a recent case in the Court of Appeal, Donna Union confirmed those wide powers of the BVI commercial courts in support of arbitration to grant freezing injunctions to appoint receivers and to order disclosure. Um, so those are potentially very helpful, including for foreign arbitrations um, powers in support of arbitration that are available in the BVI and that confirm the BVI's pro-arbitration process. Um, and the BVI courts uh, um, have judges from you know, England and you know, a very respectable court of appeal with judges from all around uh, the Caribbean sitting on it, um, including with a lot of experience of arbitration. So um, uh, it's, it's a very fast acting court and, um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, will only grow in success, uh, uh, which is the, the ultimate aim of incorporation of the BVI International Arbitration Centre and the adoption of the model law in the new BVI Arbitration Act. Um, so that's a very quick canter through possibilities for parties uh, considering enforcement or interim relief in the BVI. Um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak on the panel, unless you have any other questions, Ishan. That was actually quite uh, a, a, a brief one-on-one of what actually happens there. And uh, thank you so much for sharing all that. I will now defer it to my colleague, Theo, who, Theo, who has some questions for uh, Rose. So Theo, please. And I'll also launch the poll. Thanks, Yishan. So my first question, anyone on the panel can respond to this, and it's kind of related to what Dr. Malcolm had hinted at earlier about the cooperation or um, the need for cooperation that would be beneficial among the different jurisdictions in the Caribbean. So anyone, again, can respond to this. So we have a mix of persons who are on this webinar. Just going through a quick Glance. We have persons who are more senior than others, and then we have persons who are more junior. We have persons who uh, have just become interested in arbitration and mediation. So what advice or what information would you give them on how to become more involved in the ADR landscape in the Caribbean? Was that for me, Theo? If you wish to answer it, you can, but uh, that first question was more so to the entire panel. I have a question specifically for you after this. So however you want to do it. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll take the second question. I think you asked how can young practitioners be involved in ADR? I have, um, 
I have been in this business for a while. And I would say that it's, it's really not easy, especially as a woman and a person of color to, um, to navigate the road. So it has not been an easy road. And as you've um, indicated before, I've been all over the world. I've in Africa, in Europe, and now back in the United States. I think the best way is to really be resilient. What I mean by being resilient is just, uh, if you go around the table, there is no chair for you, bring, bring one and sit there and mm -hmm. let them push you out. Let them dare take you out. I say this, I guess with my Haitian style, we dare to do things. I guess it's in my blood to fight. Um, it's a beautiful area of practice. And I think the other thing that I've been doing for many years now is mentoring. I have a lot of, and I do that on my own without any institution. And then now as being member of, of Arbitral Women, Arbitral Women do a lot of those mentorship. I have so many mentees that I could not even take one more because at the end of the day, I still need to take care of myself. I am still a mom. I have so many other responsibility. So I think it's a matter of you knowing where you want to go and understand that like my mother used to say, I think um, it's a saying, Paris was not built in one day and step-by-step step, and, and keep on creating your pathway. And I would say to young people, there is a very negative aspect out there in being hoarder of information. I would discourage you to do that. If you have a friend and you have information that is valuable, it's better to share. And I'm saying this really because it has happened to me where people would just hide information so I won't know it. Or, like a very negative competition in the business. We don't need to do that to each other. And I think we need to uphold one another and help each other. It's much healthier. And I think in the long run, we will all benefit from it. Like Dr. Malcolm said earlier, the flower will bloom. So what do you do as a young person? Write articles and get the qualifications. Um, I would say to them, um, don't think it's just arbitration. Mediation is very valuable. Um, conciliation, learn, the, the, learn if this is the practice you wanna be in, learn all the practice area and position yourself um, and, and be kind. I think once you do that as, as a beautiful human being, as I believe human beings can be, you will see you will break ceilings. You will arrive at places they will just have to deal with you because you're so good at what you do. Be competent. That's my advice. Thanks so much for that. I wondered whether Professor Rooney or Dr. Malcolm or Paula had anything else to add to that advice given by Rose? I, I would just say that one of the things that I, I recommend and, and that actually worked, worked well for me is that a lot of the organizations that exist out there that have some um, demonstrable interest in the field are, are organizations that effectively are volunteer organizations, like our bar associations, committees, et cetera, okay? And anyone, for example, who is appointed to a position of leadership in one of those committees is immediately grateful to someone who steps up and is willing to help, okay? And, and, it, and it will, in the future, pay dividends. It is, it is not, like, like, Ro, like Rose said, it's, it's not, this is not an easy road to hope, right? Um, because it's very nice <laughs> and people like to do it. <laughs> and like she said, there's a tendency a lot of times to, to hoard, um, but, but, there's, but there's still room uh, at, at the table. And like she said, sometimes you have to push your chair up to the table, sit down and say, well, drag me out if you don't want me in here. And, but it's going to be a nasty scene, <laughs> you know? Um, but, but, but the other thing is to, obviously there's no 
excuse. There's no substitute for, for preparation, okay? So you read the new judicial decisions when they come out, you stay on top of the changes in the institutional rules. Um, you are aware of legislative developments, et cetera. Um, so, and, and then the opportunity will come for you to have the microphone at conferences. And, and the microphone is great if you prepared and know what to say, right? And, uh, and if you've been preparing yourself for that, all of a sudden um, it becomes your, really your best friend. And, and, and over time, what you do is you just, you build a reservoir of, of the projection of competence, the projection, projection of goodwill. And I think very important in this area, the quality of being able to get along with others. I think like, like, like Rose said, the idea that, that people are basically, basically good, you know, they, 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 they appreciate uh, a, a helping hand, they appreciate a, a competent person. And I think to a large extent, if you do those things, it will, things will take care of themselves. And I just one other thing for a couple of seconds I'll mention. And, and, and I, I worked in, in, in as, as legal counsel for a company for a number of years. It turned out to be a great school for me, but very hard to jump into private practice. And when I went back, when I wanted to get into private practice, I wanted to see a lawyer. And he sat down and he told me, he said, look, he said, um, write me a business plan. I said, business plan? This was, I think maybe every lawyer has a business plan in the world now. Back then, no lawyer had a business plan, except maybe this guy and me, okay? So I did, I wrote it down, I put things in paper. It gave me a structure in terms of what I, where I was and where I wanted to go. And one of the things I noticed is I came from a relatively small firm environment in terms of the, the, the world and the really large firms, et cetera. So I, I looked at organizations that I could get involved with. And I looked at ones that maybe weren't the biggest, maybe they weren't international, maybe they were more regional. One of those was actually the Inter-American Bar Association. I devoted my time to that. I devoted my time to the Florida Bar so much in, more than to the American Bar Association. I wound up in 10 years after joining the Florida Bar being the chair of the International Law Section, I got the leadership of the International Arbitration Committee of the International Inter American Bar Association. Things that either would have happened many years in the future or never would have happened in another form. So you need to, you need to choose your opportunities and your battles wisely. With that, I'll stop. If I were to add something quickly, theoretically, I think young practitioners and all of us really, should resist the temptation of being a jack doing what a master should be doing. And it is, it is sage advice in this way. The worst thing, and a businessman said this to me, the worst thing you could ever do with a bad business is to give it good advertising. <laughs> You're not ready for offering the product you're proposing to offer, do not offer it because nobody's going to forget the fact that you made a mess of it. And that is something, and what that means by extension is getting back to the preparation, preparation, preparation thing that John just spoke about. There is a, an obligation as all well to ensure that we do not simply go to say, I am an arbitrator, I'm a mediator or anything at all. Because what it is that people really want is that they want to know people who have developed competences in particular areas that they can translate into dealing with the specific matters. So there's no point in saying, I am an arbitrator who can do anything, or I'm a mediator who can do anything. I am an arbitrator whose competence is in the area of maritime. I'm an arbitrator whose competence is in the area of banking and finance, or whatever it is. Develop some real competence. And the reason for this is that if you understand what you are doing well enough, when you are sitting as an arbitrator or as counsel or as mediator or as counsel, you will have an instinctive idea of what the proper questions are, what the proper outcomes are that you're looking for, and how to guide a process to an outcome which is fair, reasonable, and capable of being acted upon. And so what it means is that people also in that great context also need to realize that they need to take more opportunities to get involved in learning opportunities. The best way 
to get yourself into anything is to get people to know you. Very few persons in the field will be seeking to make appointments or recommendations for persons they do not know. And if you're not in the business of creating effective networking opportunities and being part of them, and you simply think that you're going to hear of conferences very often that they're free, including this one, they're free, you do not make an opportunity to be involved in them. And you simply think the persons like Theo Monique or so who take the time out to be here should find it in their favor to recommend you, having not seen you involved in this sort of development, you're making a fool of yourself. I would certainly not be in the business of recommending anybody whose competence and capacity and commitment to development I have not seen and, and recognized. And I think that is what a lot of us need to bear in mind, that if you are not prepared to put in some time and effort and not prepared to be part of the network building and the competences building, then you have no place wanting to be part of the environment and the ecosystem. Theo, I love it. I, 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 I think I, I, I want to stress on the competition aspect in context in the Caribbean. There is this thing where you think maybe a group of people, they may think I am the face of the Caribbean. I think that needs to stop. Like Dr. Malcolm said the first time that he started speaking, he says, I am not, he said earlier, I am not in a position to speak for everyone in the Caribbean. And that's the beauty of it. And then he says, Rose, maybe you can speak to that. Professor Mooney, maybe you could do this. And I think we need to understand there is no such thing as face of the Caribbean. So I am from Haiti, I'm also part of the Caribbean. I may know, I may have some knowledge on Jamaica. I may have some knowledge on, um, you know, Bahamas, but I shouldn't stand myself and want to be the face of the Caribbean. And I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's bad competition out there and we need to, to, to change that so that we can, we can change the faces. It's not always roles that has to be on the webinar or, you know, so it doesn't have to be, you don't have to always be the, on the spotlight. And I, I take the example with Dr. Malcolm, what he's been doing with the Jamaica International Arbitration Center, doing the coffee time. You don't see, you know, he is the man behind the show, but you don't see him in the spotlight at every show. So it's about connecting. It's about lifting one another. And if I may just add quickly to that, Theo Monique, I know I'm, I'm, I'm overstepping my time, but this thing, there is no way you can demonstrate competence of any, cap, any jurisdiction, and I'm now taking it to jurisdiction. If you have five, six, or seven people who are stars, people look for a cadre of persons they can look to. You want to know if the five people are conflicted out, you can find others. So this idea that five, six, or seven persons will say, we are the stars, we are the go-to, we are all there is. It's a most foolish thing because that group will only fade away. But if you build a large enough capacity and you encourage others to be part of the dance, then you're going to have a much better party. It's as simple as that. Yes, that's, that's tremendous observation. What I say is that it's like if you have a, a pie of, of, of finite circumference, right? It can only feed a certain number of people, but if you have a pie that is ever expanding, right? It feeds many more people. And, and one of the things that we did in Miami, we made a conscious effort really to, to, to try to combat exactly that attitude that Christopher was talking about. And instead to create an environment in which we all could prosper instead of, like you said, just four or five people. You know? and, and to a large extent, it's worked for us. Thank you. And that's the entire purpose of this world tour that we're doing, to you know, connect people from around the world to talk and, you know, you, you might observe that uh, uh, not every speaker here is a job member because the idea is to open doors to connect people, to connect institutions, organizations from around the world, and to arrive at a certain destination in the world tour doesn't mean that the event is only confined to the region. It is to provide the opportunity for others in the world to have a look what's happening in the region. So, and uh, so yeah, thank you so much for those views. Those, those are amazing and extremely wise and we're so happy to be hearing these things. Uh, Theo, back to you again. 
Thanks, Isha. And also thank you to each of you, especially for your frankness about <laughs> what should be happening or the advice to young practitioners. I, I think it's very timely. I have one more question. I'm going to direct it to Rose. I think that a lot of persons have not been aware of the history of arbitration in Haiti. Your presentation that they have the oldest arbitration center and that they've been doing this for a while was quite insightful, I think. And I, I wanted to know what was your perspective on ways that other jurisdictions in the Caribbean, particularly the Commonwealth Caribbean jurisdictions, how can they support and include Haiti more on the regional discussions in ADR? And what can we learn from each other so that we all advance and not just one jurisdiction as opposed to the other? Thank you, Theo. As you, um, if you have looked at my profile, um, I am one of the board um, advisor of the Jamaica International Arbitration Center. I work very closely with Dr. Malcolm. That's one step. I commend him for having um, approached me and um, put me in as a board advisor. And I'm not the only Haitian I believe he put there. There was another um, practitioner who used to be a minister of justice and he's also uh, an arbitrator or a mediator. And I think that what Dr. Malcolm is speaking of today, he also is walking that walk by doing that. And um, I have spoken with um, Berta Rousseau from uh, the Bahamas. I think she has, she shares some of that views as well. But- Mr. Cooper. Yes. Um, in the, in, in, in um, I don't want to make excuses for people in the Caribbean. I know we can do better, but I think that my people also, we have to, uh, to carry some of the weight as well. And I think that that goes back to my presentation when I talk about the fragmentation in the language. It's just so happened, um, you know, when Haitians, those who left, who would leave Haiti, some of them went to school in Canada, some of them went to Paris, some of them went to the United States. But me, I have like a broad um, experience, United States, Paris, Africa. So with that, I have a little, um, I benefit a lot because I've seen a lot, but the language is, is a problem. How do we, how do we fix that? Um, we, we have to probably try to operate like we are at the United Nations, provide translation for them. And you know, that that's gonna cost money. So it's some, it's some capacity building, we, but we can't give up because we have to be engaging. For instance, what I'm doing in two days, that conference with Dominican Republic, well, most Haitians speak Spanish, so that works. Um, um, but if we want, a group of Haitians to come to Jamaica. That can happen. Um, we may have to do a small little translation for some of them, but there are a lot of them who may not be able to speak, but they understand much more than they speak, or they are shy. They are afraid to make mistakes when they speak. So I, I, I know that we can do better. And I think we are on our way. And I think that, um, um, I, I say Dr. Malcolm because I work with him and I say, I mentioned Berta because we've been in communication. There are other people in the Caribbean who are willing to do that. And I think it's just, um, that's one of the ways we can, uh, I would say cross over and hold each other in this, in the moment and, and promote each other. Um, and for Haiti also, eventually possibly to, to, to enact new laws to, to get on, but they are still in the old system, but they are doing it. Um, like, like Paula was saying earlier, she's seen a lot of um, uh, requests for enforcement. In Haiti, it's, it's the norm. You don't get to just come in and enforce an award unless it's probably an exceed award. And you have to go to, to, to court and the court has to um, agree and look at it and say, oh, that's a good judgment, and then put the seal. And there was a whole process, uh, homologation, whatever they call it. And, 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 and then when you finally get that, they say, okay, now you, you can go. 
and it has to be by the uh, uh, tribunal de grande instance, the president. So it's very old fashioned, but I, and that's why I have hope for mediation. And that's how I, I, I like the concept of dispute avoidance. And that's why I've been going to Unsitio and really trying to get there. And hopefully I can um, um, advise Haitians and um, work more with people from the Caribbean. And that's, that's what I would say, Theo. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Wow. Before we conclude, I wondered where, whether any of the panelists had any final words that they wish to say or build on any of the presentations. Uh, I, I would actually want to invite Paula because uh, she's the youngest of the speakers we have today and she's uh, someone who moved to the BVI. And what advice would you like to give to um, our peers about uh, practicing in the BVI and uh, any career advice? Um, so I, I meant to, I'm sorry, at, at the end of the question about advice to young uh, practitioners who are interested in arbitration um, and just just say that um, to be patient. Uh, I, I think when you're starting out um, and particularly, uh, you know, it's a competitive field, as Rose mentioned, and it's easy to compare yourself to your peers and see how fast they're progressing. And, and I think that there are many different avenues now. Um, I think there are also a lot of people in the arbitration field that maybe started out in, you know, in a slightly different field or have some transactional experience. Um, so I think that if, if you're really interested in it, it's a fantastic area, but that um, you know, to and keep, uh, keep working on it. And, I would also advise, um, you know, taking part in the international MOOC competitions. You know, if you're a student, like the Viz MOOC, um, those are great opportunities to meet arbitration practitioners from around the world, um, to develop your skills and to learn, and then to stay involved with those competitions afterwards, and to volunteer your time as an arbitrator, um, uh, you know, and reviewing memorials because. Um, as Professor Rooney said, you know, it's all voluntary time and it's remembered and it's appreciated. Um, but it, it's also a great way to network and make contacts. And if you have the opportunity to attend conferences, um, you also, you know, really have an amazing opportunity to meet wonderful um, experienced pr pr uh, practitioners, as I did uh, in the BVI at the, at the conference, uh, met ma this, many of the speakers here today. So um, I think, you know, in the BVI, there's a great opportunity to do uh, very international work, um, you know, uh, so top class insolvency and litigation work, uh, very often with ties to Asia, um, and uh, in increasingly a little bit Africa. So if you're in interested in international law, uh, it's, it's a fantastic place uh, to work and there's great opportunities because it's a small jurisdiction um, to get into court, which uh, is always what attracted me to arbitration. Um, I, uh, and also why I previously moved to New Zealand where uh, it's not a split profession at the bar. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, when you've done all the hard work, which the younger professionals uh, will relate to on a case, uh, it's, you know, it's great to be able to go and appear and assist, um, you know, at a hearing and, and to get the experience of being in a hearing. So um, uh, that, that would be my advice. And uh, I think that, I guess what my career has shown is that, um, you know, there are different opportunities all around the world um, uh, if you're open minded um, and uh, while sometimes you might feel that you're taking a step back, you will often look back at your experience. Uh, certainly for me, going to New Zealand gave me the opportunity to appear in trials as junior counsel and, and that's such an incredibly valuable experience when you're sitting beside senior counsel and they're relying on you. Um, I think you know there's no learning experience like it, and, and in litigation, that's the best opportunity. Of course, I have that opportunity much earlier on, which I think is what attracts a lot of us to it. 
Thank you so much for organizing this wonderful event. Thank, thank you, you for so much, participating. Dr. And thank you to each of you for responding to those questions. I think there were several little nuggets of wisdom in there, particularly that you have to be resilient when you're building your career as a young arbitration practitioner. And then also as Professor Malcolm and Professor Rooney and, and Rose also emphasize that you have to be competent and you have to offer something of value to the persons who may be interested in having you as an arbitration practitioner or arbitrator. So thank you again. And I'm sure everybody who has an announcement to make or. Uh, yeah, so, sorry, I was freezing a bit. Um, I want to thank the panel and uh, to some to sum the panel up and uh, the moderators, I think it pays to volunteer. That's what I would say. And this is called the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators ADR World Tour Arbitration and Mediation as a Global Force for Good. This is modeled as uh, an 11 stop series as though it were a rock show. And these individuals that you've heard from today call themselves ADR practitioners. They are rock stars.